Welcome to another episode of Expedition. I'm David Greenwood, your host for today's episode. Think back to five years ago. What were you doing? Chris Lucas and his father, Neil, were on a 500 mile canoe journey through the Canadian wilderness. Today, I'm sitting down with Chris to talk about his film that documents the adventure, The Yukon Assignment. Over to you, Chris. Hello, good evening, Chris. How are you? I'm well, David. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Whereabouts in the world are you calling in from this evening? Um, I'm calling in from the north coast of Cornwall um, on a, on a fa- fairly wet day. We've had really nice weather recently, but yeah, it's a little bit miserable tonight, but still looking good. We're here today to talk about your film, The Yukon Assignment. Perhaps you want to give a brief introduction to those listening about the film. It's a story of a journey that I took with my father um, by canoe in the Canadian Yukon. Um, and uh, the, the, the premise of it, I guess, is, is really just escaping the norm and making time for those family connections that you otherwise might not, um, you might not experience. So we, uh, we, we were um, journeying for about a month. It was just us and one canoe. Um, we, uh, we, we got a float plane to, to fly us in. So we were really, really isolated. Um, and just having that kind of extra time to sit around the campfire and have some chats and um, work together was, uh, um, was, was a special thing to us, but we, we obviously filmed it and we've tried to bring that together in a, in a film that gives a sense of what it's like to go on a big expedition in a, in a place like that. And, um, hopefully give some insight into the, the more sort of human human side of things that, that hopefully applies to most people's situations or, or at least somebody can can take something out of it. But this isn't your first expedition by the sounds of it. In the film you alluded to doing this professionally. Yeah so I've um, I, I, yeah I've, I've been an outdoor professional my, my whole career really um, uh, working with people in the outdoors teaching them rock climbing canoeing all those sorts of things and um and taking groups uh, off on expeditions um all around the world um so i mean put part of the sort of uh original uh, genus if you like of the of this expedition was my, my dad getting a bit fed up that i was having all the fun really um and that uh, and, and that he wanted to do something too and he um he muttered the um uh, sort of immortal words of I don't suppose I'll do that now and that for me was red rag to the to a ball and we, we started planning and trying to put a trip together so that he um he'd, he'd felt that because it's something he'd always dreamt of doing um and I think when we started planning he, he was probably about 63 uh coming up to retirement um so it was a it was a nice sort of transition uh um supposedly for him as it turned out it was for me as well which I'm sure we'll get into um, but at the time, it was it was about that kind of him coming towards retirement and starting by feeling like he wouldn't do something like that. Um, and of course, we did. And it was very much a reversal of roles throughout the film in that you were acting very much as the parent. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, not, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not sure I thought about it in terms of parenting him, but... Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was a strange dynamic because normally um, people are essentially paying me to look after them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that, that's, that's my sort of go-to in terms of um, making sure the safety sorted out and um, th- things like competen- competency in the canoe. Um, we didn't get as much training together as, as I was hoping before the expedition. So we had to do a bit of that on the hoof. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh and it's and it's it's difficult because obviously we're talking about the film but um we have have to bear in mind that that's uh an hour and 26 minutes cut from 100 hours of footage which is cut from a, a you know a, a month of doing it so um i guess that the film perhaps uh portrays that um whereas that for, for me one of the interesting thing was, was that perhaps my dad's confidence wasn't massive to begin with with those outdoor skills but 
you know, it, originally when I was growing up, he was teaching me a lot of those things. Um, and it didn't take very long for you know him for, to go off and get the firewood and get the fire going and all those sorts of things. It was a, it was a matter of days before he was sort of back in the groove as far as that's concerned. Um, I think we worked out the last time he'd actually been in a canoe was 1968. So it's <laughs> a bit fair to say that he needed a little bit of support. <laughs> There's a great shot at the start of the film. I believe it's on a practice day uh, with you and your dad and him trying to get into the canoe. And you're just sitting there saying, are you there? Yet? Are you in yet? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that, you're right. Now that's, that's on a, a lovely bit of Cornish river down by Laren actually. Um, gorgeous. Uh, but um, we, we weren't sure whether to just have the entire film in Canada. Um, Cause we have, we have a lot of footage from the, the, the training days and things beforehand. Okay. Um, but we felt that we needed to show something of um, how, <laughs> kind of unprepared we were to go pretty much um because that that was that was a bit of a theme and just that just the uh that, that kind of dynamic between us really that i was i was trying to um i suppose try try and do it properly and um it just didn't kind of work out that way <laughs> uh, ideally I, on a kind of sort of anecdotal note on that that the, the reason that i'm in the front is that he struggled with his knees so we found that he couldn't sit in the front of the canoe so our, our life would have been much easier if I could have sat in the back and then I could have known what he was doing and give him a lot more advice. Um, but because he, he had to be in the back, because he had to stretch his legs out, um, we had a, had an awful lot of uh, situations like that. I just had no idea what, what he was doing. I think we were three weeks in before I glanced over my shoulder and realised that he was paddling in the same direction as me. So I was putting in all these corrected <laughs> strokes and we were just fighting against each other. We'd been, we'd been doing that for three weeks and I had no idea. And on, on another occasion, the canoe started veering off towards the bank and I looked around and he was asleep. <laughs> A perfect co-pilot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so going back on your unpreparedness, from watching the film, it didn't seem that way at all. Um, well, it did. It did. I mean, I, yeah, I've, I've perhaps underplayed how prepared we were because on... on in, in some aspects, and particularly the planning of the actual logistics of it, um, that, that had to be prepared pretty meticulously. Um, a, a lot of the planning phase was actually just trying to work out where we were going to go. So um, the original trip uh, was actually going to be down a Scottish river, um, but that didn't, that didn't sort of see, seem like quite, quite enough um, as a sort of trip of a lifetime. Then we looked at the Glockwood National Park, um, and that wasn't quite big enough. So we kept coming back to the Yukon. So once settled on that, the, the joy of these days is there's so much information you can get on the internet. You can um, see other people's uh, trips. You know, th thinking back to when I originally got into this game, so to speak, I'd be going up to London and going to the RGS map room and calling up expedition reports. Uh, and it was a really big thing to work out what other people had done. Now you just type it into Google and it's, there's so much resource there. So um, that, that sort of pinned us down to, yes, we want to go to the Yukon. Um, the Peel watershed seemed very appealing because it's got um, uh, uh, these, these five rivers that all head up towards the Arctic Ocean. Mm. Um, and it also had the opportunity to cross the Arctic Circle, which my dad hadn't done before. Um, and they're, they're, they're sufficiently remote that you have to get a float plane in, which was uh, one of the things that we really wanted to do because it's that kind of... Um, uh, uh, sort of ca characteristic, typical, proper Yukon canoe expedition -y type thing to do. Yeah. Um, and then it was just research, research, research. And there, so some some rivers will have guidebooks that will literally break it down. This wasn't one of them. Um, and uh, so I've got, you know, I've got a massive spreadsheet that's a bit like a root card, but couldn't really work out exactly where we we're going to camp but you can break down over uh, over the distance sort of roughly where you need to stop each time mm. various different objectives we might have like mountains we wanted to climb and things like that um and then the the two main reference points were we were going to get flown in on this day and then roughly a month later we were going to get picked up by a van on the Dempster highway mm. at 12 o'clock noon um everything in between had to be worked out um and how much food we needed so working that out on the basis of how many calories per day what we could actually fit inside two barrels 
uh, we ended up having about 60 kilos of food. Wow. Um, and then the really complex part of it, which uh, was reasonably new to me at the time, uh, was filming the thing as well. So you, you then got which cameras do we need? How are we going to waterproof the cameras? How are we going to chop batteries? How are we going to log the footage? How are we going to storyboard the whole thing? So yeah, there, there was a massive amount of planning. I'd, I'd say we weren't doing it. We weren't doing the planning full time, but it took a good year to, to to plan the trip originally. And when you did start, there was this part where you were reading quite ominous sounding stories left in a refuge log. How intimidating was that? I, I wanted a river that that was that wasn't going to push me personally skill set that much um, because I knew that to a certain extent I was going to have to make sure my dad was okay. Um, but most importantly, and, and that, that excerpt that happened to someone else um, illustrates just that when you're in those really uh, proper wilderness areas, not much has to go wrong for it to be catastrophic. Um, and, and what had happened to him is that there was, there was two ways to do the first part of the channel. You could take a whole day over it, which is what we did, and carefully pick your canoe down using traditional techniques that are called lining, where you take the rope and you negotiate the canoe down and pass it down the narrow channels mm. um or you can risk it for a biscuit and just try and run it mm. which if you were in the bars if i were the dark or something you might go oh that, that'd be right if you capsize you get a bit wet you swim to the bank um and you carry on worst case scenario you you go to the cafe and it's it's all good um when you're out there something like a capsize if and and this this happened to this this um this other person unfortunately that he lost his passport satellite communications um very lucky to not lose the boat itself because you're you know the, the boat itself is your your lifeline to, to to get back out into civilization and fortunately it happened only a, a day's walk from the um uh, place that the float plane lands you know, imagine if that happened two weeks into the trip you could be looking at a month walking out um, uh, without any food. So it, we had to be reasonably risk adverse because actually just being there in that environment was, was risky enough. Throughout the film, I started keeping a tally of how many times the word bear was used. And oh, yes. it, it got to over 50 and then I stopped counting. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, they just require a huge amount of respect. Um, because they they're apex predators and um on a canoe trip like this you're 100 percent going into their environment mm -hmm. um not just where they live but where they um will uh, fish for their food um they will use the the, the rivers as a as a main transit because it's easier than going through the tundra or the the forest um so everything stacked towards you potentially really winding up a bear um <laughs> yeah and um and you don't want to do that um and uh i mean the the, the the grizzly bears tend to be reasonably uh not necessarily shy but just aloof and not too fast you know they, they don't want to get involved the, the, the black the black bears can be pretty aggressive and actually go for you just um just for a bit of fun so it seems mm -hmm. um but yeah it's uh I've, I've I've been in bear country quite a few times, but I wouldn't say that I've. Um, I, I don't think it would be safe to get complacent about it. I think when when you get to the point that you're like totally chilled when you're in a environment, and it's the same if you're in the desert and there are lions or cheetahs, whatever you know, if wherever you're going, if if there's some something else that's a lot more capable at killing stuff than you are, um, you need to <laughs> you, you you need to be quite quite aware about that um and your, your biggest mitigation is your awareness it's that situational awareness that if you don't walk into that situation or in this case paddle into that situation to start with it's um it's not going to escalate um and I, th I think the scene that you're referring to there is a kind of case in point that we did sort of blunder into a, a situation that we couldn't then back off from and and uh and and these things are super powerful they'll rip through you and they can run at 30 miles an hour mm. so there's there's very little you can do you, you're not going to run away from them you can't climb up anything um so that your your only mitigation against it really is is just to just to avoid winding one up to start with mm. steering well clear yeah 
peeing around your tent, apparently. Yes, allegedly that works. That might just be somebody winding me up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think, I mean, and that's the thing is that, bet, uh, particularly grizzly bears, aren't, aren't going to look for a fight. It's only if they feel threatened. Um, so if it smell, smells like human, human urine and generally human-y, they'll, they'll probably steer away. Um, we had things like our, our food barrels were always well away from where we were camping um, and, and uh, separate from the boat so that we sort of had different cutoffs. But these, these bears are in a very, very wild place. They're not kind of as aggressive as you might have in somewhere like Yosemite, for example, where they're very used to humans being around um, and, and humans mean food, as in the human food, not eating humans necessarily. Um, <laughs> So, so the, the, these aren't. Uh, it's, it's actually quite unusual to see them. Uh, we, we were very lucky to see to see two bears on a on a month long trip. Um, I'm sure plenty more bears saw us. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. And it's not just the wildlife that requires the respect. And you talked about this both early on in the film, but also as you were moving down the river in that that part of the world the conditions can change very very quickly yeah well um yeah it's, it's as you describe really it's um it's very variable um when it gets wet it gets really really wet um and uh and, and we were crossing the arctic circle so um you, you feel the effect of that the the, the wind um predominantly certainly towards the latter part of the trip was coming from the north Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, one good thing is that during that time, it, you've you've got the the midnight sun, so it never really gets dark. So even at night, the temperature doesn't change hugely. Um, but certainly, with like wind chill and when when it's wet, it will it will feel it will feel sub zero even even when it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's that's the worst of it. You know, we always talk about with hypoth- hypothermia that the ingredients to that is cold, wet, and wind. Um, and that kind of environment has all those three ingredients in in spades. There's a part of the film where you're getting noticeably quite tired and don't really want to eat. You don't really want to stop. It, it's it's, a, it's a, definitely a reminder. It doesn't matter how often I've said it to groups and you know looked at studies and have an understanding of how people get to that situation. If you if you don't correct your behavior and your decisions early on when you're getting really cold very quickly you get to the stage that you're you're not aware of how cold you are um and that's what happened on that day really is that a a wiser decision probably would have been it's really horrible today we're quite tired let's just stay in camp for the day um but we wanted to press on so we started must have got really cold because then things like shall we stop and try and warm up became no let's just keep paddling which very rapidly dissolved into not really talking about anything at all and on on the day day in the the film that you described we we actually covered two days of route card in a single day i think we paddled something like 70 kilometers um and it and it and the worst of that is that i hadn't i had no kind of realization that we'd done that until we came across a thumping great view mountain that we weren't supposed to see for a couple of days and, and realized that we'd actually skipped an entire day um and uh, and, th- and that was the wake up moment really of thinking right we stop here we need to get camp set up and we need a fire straight away um because again you're you're so remote that that sort of thing that can spiral out of control and you make a simple mistake that leads to a capsize uh, and um, and it's curtains how long did it take you to recover in camp? Did you give yourself a few days? Just to we did actually. Yeah, I mean, the, the literal effects of hypothermia, you warm up um, pretty quickly because we we had quite a lot of safety kits. So we uh, had things like a, a petrol stove. We were mainly cooking over um, open fires, but we had the petrol stove partly for environmental reasons for, for when um, wood was scarce, uh, which wasn't very often actually. Um, but also for emergency situations like this. So we were able to get hot water on straight away. And and that's the thing, we could have done that during the day, but we just weren't thinking straight. Um, So I'd I'd definitely say by the next morning, we were feeling better from that perspective, a bit shaken up that we'd let it get that far. Mm. 
um but we stayed in the same place for for three days there just to kind of get our heads around what had happened and just fully recover and get some rest before pressing on mm. and the food looked really good oh absolutely no there's um there's no point eating horrible food when you're on these things um <laughs> and one of the the great things about going in a canoe is you can take much heavier food so uh, even at the right at the end of the trip we still had things like onions and potatoes and things like that um so i think the food came to about 60 kilos between us mm. um, but yeah initially, initially we had rump steak bacon and eggs wow loads and and that, and that's the advantage of it being that little bit cooler is that uh, um, you don't have to worry about things going off quite so quickly. It's a really beautiful part of the world, both in the the scenery around the flat plains of the river, but it's also quite a mountainous area as well. And you went on some great adventures and great day hikes up the mountains. Yeah, I mean, you could you could endlessly. Um, um, hopefully one one day go back but i mean every corner we turned around there were tens of mountains that were, were just all beckoning as the you know the, that amazing ridge lines and uh, spiny summits and things just mm. out of view and that's just what you can see from the river uh, but i think coming from britain going somewhere like that the sense of scale is just extraordinary the the the, the little in inverted commas from a Canadian point of view, uh, watershed that we were going through is the size of Scotland mm. and just that one watershed. Um, so you get, get to the top of some of those mountains and look out. And I'm always struck by this whenever I go into um, the tiger forest, that that's essentially the same forest that's a, a, a band right the way around our planet, albeit you get a little bit wet in between. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, you're just looking out and, go straight across Canada into Siberia across to Lapland um the the the, the amount of different places that that you could explore from there and we had a little sampling of that but um you yeah you could you could spend spend the rest of your life just wandering around those hills find finding new places probably people hadn't been before in, in a lot of cases mm. and if you're bringing the food I could do it for a lifetime yeah, <laughs> fully, fully catered. <laughs> yeah. Were there parts on the trip where it was quite dangerous in paddling down the river? Yeah, it's um, it, it there were there were definitely some some challenging sections. Um, and again, it comes back to that kind of remoteness of it. Really, you've got uh, the the, the best part of a quarter of a ton of weight in the canoe, so it's not responsive as it would be if you were just going recreationally paddling in in the uk or something like that uh and and two of us in it as well so you're having to work as a team um anticipating things a long way in advance mm. um and again if you were going down a, a uk river you might go with someone who'd already done it or you might looked at the guidebook um and we didn't have that opportunity we we had to kind of read what we call read and run you check out what's ahead of you and as long as you can see a way through or you think you can you go for it and um uh, hopefully most of the time it works out and uh, unfortunately it did um but i mean there, there were a lot of proper objective hazards that the just capsizing by itself doesn't necessarily hurt you but it's it's what you hit on the way so are you going to get hit by rocks um are you going to get sucked under a fallen tree that's got loads of sharp sticks coming out of it? Um, the, the canyon was particularly scary for me because it took a, an almost 90 degree bend. And where it did that, the water had carved out a kind of, uh, kind of cave just under the water. So it's like a, uh, yeah. a little overhang. Um, so, I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't even bear thinking about, about what would happen to you if you got sucked under there because yeah. there were dead there, there were sort of dead fallen trees that were underneath there and you just wouldn't come out um so i mean as it as it went that the, the paddling wasn't technically that difficult but the level of risk on on that canyon section was quite great because if we drifted off to the right um at a certain point it wouldn't matter how hard we paddled we would get sucked under there and, and wouldn't come out again um, so it was really important to get get our lines right mm. um, on, on the approach. Uh, we're quite quite relieved to get get through it. 
I can't imagine a canoe that size loaded up with all your gear is too nimble either. No, it's it's horrendous. I mean, it's it's a a real juggernaut, um, and and the river's moving very quickly as well. So part of the thing with paddling is that in order to have control, you either need to be going slower or faster than the river. Um, and the situation like that, we needed a certain amount of speed to get across the river. Um, but you then, if you're if you're going too fast and you slip up, whatever happens is going to happen that that much faster. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was it was a bit dicey, but more than anything else, more than anything else, the canyon bit was psychological that we built it up in our heads for over a year, knowing that that was a a tricky bit. And actually, that there was probably plenty of places along the river that were uh, were more dangerous or trickier to do. It's just that we didn't know that we had to face those until we'd already done it, by which point we didn't have to worry about it anymore. Um, but the canyon had, had loomed in our minds for quite some time as, as, as the bit that we had to get through. Yeah, that's sometimes a danger of, I wouldn't say too much preparation, but putting it in your mind and overthinking it, yeah. you can quickly make problems seem bigger than they are. And that's not just an adventure, that's life in general. Yeah. And, and can you, canyons as a general rule are problematic for canoeists because if you if you do fall out again bring it back to a british river um if i was scouting a rapid one of the first things i would look at is right there's a great big eddy at the bottom of this rapid um if you fall out guys swim into that and we'll group up on the bank um but when you're dealing with a with a canyon that extends the best part of 15 kilometers and has 800 foot walls on either side you don't have that option <laughs> yeah um, so that you, if you did capsize, you'd literally be just trying to stay afloat for 15 kilometers until there was a beach that you could hopefully swim out on. Um, so it's, it's just a whole, whole different ball game. And the, the trick to it is just don't fall out. <laughs> I remember that one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. What are the feelings coming to the final stretch of the journey? after five weeks of being on the water and going through some hairy moments, but also some really very powerful bonding moments with your dad, but also um, adventurous moments climbing up the mountains. What were you both feeling? What was the general sentiment between the both of you at the final couple of days or at the, the final point, as you know, the end is nigh? Mm. Um, our, our kind of feelings about it um, went in two different directions at that point. I think I think my dad actually uh, alludes to it or, or or says about it in the film that he he definitely felt that he was at the end of the trip that he wanted to do, um, and there was a certain amount of winding down that he he knew the end was there, so he he began to just sort of look forward to the end, uh, if that makes sense. That mm. um, and and the. The reality is the last um, almost two weeks of of the trip uh, was was really tough because it was a the the river was a, a different nature. We were on the peel at that point, um, so it was it was lumbering. It was really wide. It was cl cloudy uh, water with all the silt that was in it. Um, the view didn't really change for days on end. These big cliffs that I'm talking about were incredibly impressive to start with. But ten days in, when you've got wind in your face, um, it's just like I can't, I can't face another great big grey cliff. <laughs> um, so psychologically, we were quite, um, quite worn out to, towards the end, um, and 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 obviously physically, we'd we'd um, we'd we'd been through a, a fair bit as well. Um, my 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 feelings on it were a bit different. That I. I um, and, and I quite often get this after a, a certain amount of time that I, I, I think I say in the film that I've gone feral, but it sort of feels that you sort of get get into get into a bit of flow and feel that you could almost do it indefinitely um, of being in that environment. So that was that was part of, I guess, what I would describe as as the old me that seeks those adventures and things. But I was also quite torn because. My wife was um, at home and and pregnant, um, so I uh, really throughout the whole trip there was a large part of me that felt guilt for being there to start with, mm. um, and also uh, wanting to get back to get back to her and 
um, a huge, a huge amount, to be completely honest, a huge amount of apprehension at this whole idea of becoming a dad, which um, when we started planning the trip, I had no idea that was going to happen. Um, but, uh, but, but obviously having found that out, what became a kind of trying to bond with my dad also became a trying to get my head around, right. What kind of dad do I want to be? Um, and how do I, how do I match that up really with this wanting to go to wild places and things like that? And, um, so yeah, that's, uh, again, a long, long rambly way of answering that, but we, we were in different places, I would say in, in terms of how we, how we felt towards the end. I just want to say thank you for taking the time to put that film together and everyone that was involved in putting that film together, because for me, it was a great watch for any outdoors person. Um, it's a very, very good adventure documentary, but it's also for many people watching something that I, I think will hit home quite closely. If you're thinking about taking an adventure with a family member or a very close friend, and might just turn the tables in actually getting you out and doing it. So for that, I, I want to thank you. Oh, that's, that's very kind, David. I really appreciate it. And I'll, I'll pass it on to the team as well. Cause that, that, um, it's, yes, it, it's been, it's been a journey in every sense, uh, really the, the putting the film together as, as well as the expedition. Um, and one of the really, uh, wonderful things has been hearing back from people, um, some people that were kind of with us on Facebook and things like that, even before the expedition that have now been out with their families and going on little, little local trips and some on massive, great, big, uh, a, a few people actually we've heard of, um, that have been to the Yukon and, and, and done canoe trips off, off the back of the film. So that's, that's really special to us as well. Call your father, mother, brother, sister, whoever. Chris has certainly inspired me to start planning for a new adventure. Chris now runs Wilderness Photographic courses in the UK. Go to wildernessphotographic.com for more information. And if you haven't watched the film yet, what are you listening to this for? Yukonassignment.org is where you'll find links to watch it and everything you need to know about the film. Until next time, bye.